Marks, can yep. you quickly share your screen just to make sure we that, uh, that uh, to do the check basically, and then we can I think we can start. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Just one quick second. Yes, we can see. Uh, and see. Right. Go so. to present mode. Yes, we can also see the full the full screen. Okay, good. Uh, okay. And then I think I think I All think right. that's it. Right now, you're not seeing anything, right? Nope. Uh, it's it's done. okay. Uh, I guess then Donut, we can. I guess we can start or. Hi, I'm Donat Agosti. The co-moderator is uh, Alex Ioannidis tonight. We welcome you to the TEDx 2021 virtual conference. This is session 18 entitled Discovering Known Bi Biodiversity, D Digital Accessible Knowledge. And I'm <clears throat> Our tech support is from the University of Florida and we already thank them very much for all the support we had and we'll have during the session. The session will be recorded for later viewing. Please speak slowly and clearly for our international attendees. Thank you for you all for joining us and thank you to all the speakers in the session. Each presenter will present for 10 minutes. There will be three minutes of questions at the end of each presentation and two minutes to transition between presenters. Please ask questions of the speakers using the question and answer feature in HUA, and these will be asked of the presenter by the co-moderator. There are two chats available in HUA. The one available from your Zoom screen is not persistent. The one that is part of the HUA platform will be able to be used and seen by anyone accessing the session on demand. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see your, our code of conduct document for more information. Please bear with any technical difficulties we may have and enjoy the session. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Uh, no now we can. Yes. No, yes. Okay. yes. So today we talk about rediscovering known biodiversity. I will present the brief introduction followed by a set of uh, lectures, which are covering specific elements of this talk, of this uh, um, endeavor. In almost 30 years ago, the world had one of the biggest, at that time, uh, political summit in Brazil, the Rio Earth Summit. It had a focus on a biodiversity crisis, and more importantly, the idea of monitoring biodiversity came up. In 1995, a group of us thought we cannot just protect the world using feathery, furry, and plants, but we also need some of the, the, the majority, like insects. 
And we were able to get relatively easy a standard protocol to collect and some measure and, and, and uh, monitor. But the question that remained from the very beginning was identification. So what taxon is it? What do I know about this taxon? What is its distribution? For monitoring purposes, we need to have a baseline. How many species are where at the given time? And for that purpose, we need a complete catalog of about how many species we know, so we can say we lost so many, or we need to have data about them, and we have to integrate this with the scientific endeavor, the ever-changing names. In the 90s, we also had an, a unique chance that the internet came up. We quickly took it and made access to this information accessible by, by digitizing all the ant literature, so everybody anywhere in the world had access. And in this cluster map, you could see easily that the difference between having everything in one place at Harvard University uh, showed a huge interest by users from all around the world. Today, almost third, like 20 years later, publications and data from publications are really integrated in the research data lifecycle. Data in the publications are liberated, they are used and, and reused in GBIF. Scientists come to GBIF and, and use data, especially the occurrence data, make analysis, publish, and the articles are republished, uh, re repurposed, and go back into the, the research data life cycle. So this works because the data becomes digital accessible knowledge. That means data that can be used in different formats and understood. A target functionality of the digital accessible knowledge is that data, whenever it's published, shows up immediately in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, in the catalog of life, or in Wikidata. And on the side, again, it saves you a huge amount of time because you don't have to click, go and find PDFs or articles. It avoids errors in translation makes your data immediately relevant so people can see, can use it, and can, can challenge it too. It provides a much wider dissemination of and access to your data and makes really biodiversity data first-class digital citizens. The challenge is that there are about 500 million printed pages of, of which maybe 100 to 200 millions are in digital format. There is a continuous PDF imprisoned closed access publishing world so that means we need a huge investment to make the imprisoned data first-class citizens. We need a triage system to find out which one we should and how another strategic decision, how we best do make this data accessible. Biodiversity folks are in a unique situation, in a very lucky situation in almost all the entire science. In 1758 and 1753, Linnaeus not only coined the Latin binomial, but he also started to create taxonomic treatments. Taxonomic treatments are sections of text which are delimited by the scientists, so they're un unambiguous, they're easy to, to spot. They include a nomenclature section, they have like a treatment citation section, citing previous works, previous um, treatments. They talk about distribution, there's a description part, and even at Linnaeus time, there was a section on, on biological interactions. And all this already at that time has been based on Linnaeus collection. But scientific pu publications are more than just treatments. There's essentially already a, a, a network, a citation network. So there are treatments, there are images, they cite each other, there are keys, they, are, they cite uh, digital specimens, digital specimens cite physical specimen in collections and so on. So essentially, each publication is its, its own little network. But there is more in these publications. There are a huge amount of links to external re resources. There are links to names, taxonomic names. There are links to, to uh, treatment citations. There are links to publications. There are links to, to, to uh, institutions, to specimens, and so on. So there's already here, it's a huge amount of, of, of data which lays bare if we don't have this in the digital world. And if you look at a single material citation, 
you see the huge amount of links and linking exists within one single material citation. So there's a link, a specimen code, which links to a, a physical specimen somewhere in the collection. There's a location, there is a link to a collection. And then there are people popping up in various places. So there's a collector, there's a person coming up as an author of the treatment and of the, 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 uh, the journal of the article, or they, there's the authority of the taxonomic name. So if you now think that we not only link from them, but also link back, that's the, the whole idea of the, the uh, bicycle, make bidirectional links, do you see this huge potential that is if you make this properly accessible. There are also figures, figures we can take out to make them fair data, we can make them citable by adding a lot of metadata. There are tables inside and tables become increasingly important if you export them. So tables have like taxonomic names, there are voucher numbers, the gene bank accession numbers. And if you make all this data really accessible, we have a huge wealth of data and the best curated data in a sense, because that's a scientist himself, the specialist who curated this data. So in the Plotsy world, we believe, and to make this data, the main data types we need to actually open up this, this wealth is we need treatments, treatment citations, material citations, taxonomic names, codes, persons in various forms, figures and tables. And we envision that we probably could make all of them like uh, digital accessible knowledge by linking them to, to uh, respective vocabularies and, and uh, reference libraries. So we, we provide accessible data in, in, the, uh, in a fair format. So they are accessible, findable, their licenses to interoperate and they're ready for reuse for, for further research. They're defined in terms of granularity and quality control. They're accessible for refinable, for, for specific uses, improvement. So if somebody finds an error, they can come back. This can be easily changed. There is a versioning and provenance there. And it's now already an integral part of the main science infrastructure. Plotsy maintains two main infrastructures. So that's the biodiversity literature repository. We will hear more. That's repository at Zenoda, which includes right now over 400,000 images, about 200,000 taxonomic treatments out of 65,000 articles. There's treatment bank, which includes about the same number of articles, but 620,000 treatments and a million material citations. And you see there's a difference between almost 200 taxonomic treatments and 600,000 taxonomic treatments. And that's because of the quality control. We'll come back on that later. And if you compare with what we have in, in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, where PLOTS is the biggest uh, data set provider, there are 465,000 material citations out of the million we have. And again, the reason is that we are careful not to upload everything, but even then there are some problems. But keep in mind that the goal is really to get material citations and make them accessible for you to make more out of this. It's like digging out the diamond and somebody has to come and then make out of this raw diamond, the diamond which is the perfect for a, ma a marriage band. We've also uh, applications which make use of these names. That's uh, great that we'll talk about. We have tools to provide access and, and uh, search to the images. And to build, the idea is to do it once, do it right for everybody. We also can consider converting a look at this analogy of activation energy in, in physics. So right now we need to spend a lot of energy to get into a stage where we can operate much more efficiently. We also believe that we have to automate as much as possible and minimize human curation to where it's absolutely needed. So we should not block experts to do routine work, which can be done by a machine, but really getting the chance to focus where it's best. You will see more about this workflow. Essentially, it's a workflow which has an input like uh, publications can be PDF, XML, or, or, uh, or, or uh, other formats. We decode them, which is uh, one of the main problems in reading in especially PDFs. We enhance them, this data quality control, we hear more. Then there is create open fair data. 
we go disseminate the data. So there's everything we do goes into treatment banks. You can look at that. It's being reused. And now, as I mentioned before, there's a closed loop now. So we also disseminate data, not just in the green world here, which is the biodiversity world, but increasingly we disseminate data into the uh, life science world. And that's interesting because they have much better tax and data mining tools than we have, but there's also, then it becomes integral part of life sciences and biomedical literature. Plus we work with Wikidata to get data in this world. And of course, by opening up, Google can really find more our, our data. In this lecture series, we have a series of lectures. So we have a lecture on strategies, followed by a lecture on, on linking and reuse, then by quality control, making fair data, an application of uh, species, And finally, we start to talk about community involvement and plan to do so. Two other lectures are also part of that. So we already hear this afternoon, the the lecture in the bicycle symposium on linking. And tomorrow night, late in the European time, we'll talk about the collaboration between the Biodiversity Heritage Library and us to get data, their data into, uh, into GBIF. So this is a very th technically a very, very exciting thing which is happening, but I just want to make one last comment. Stop producing legacy publications. It's really, really, really expensive and really stupid. It adds errors, it adds users' time. Please, please consider prospective publishing where you publish and the data is ex immediately accessible to everybody anywhere in the world. Thank you. So uh, thank you a lot for the, the very nice introduction. So we have very little time for questions because we're a bit over over time. But uh, <clears throat> otherwise, being an introductory talk, I think you will listen to you will hear most of the things that are not showed uh, from, from the next uh, sessions. Uh, I think we, we can start with the next session already. So the Marcus Guidotti will be presenting a treatment bank and basically the workflow of how all of this uh, <clears throat> all these treatments and all of this uh, all of this uh, data basically gets ingested and uh, what's basically the pipeline to, to get all of this uh, uh, will this graph okay <clears throat> thank you alex uh my can, can you see my screen yes okay yep. um yeah, so, so the goal with this talk is essentially to explain the behind the scenes of this daunting task of liberating data from legacy publications, uh, especially. So my name is Marcus Guidotti. I worked for Plazi for uh, over two years, and it, it has been an incredible adventure to be part of this data liberation and, uh, and uh, well, linking as well. So in this presentation, I, I'm... I'm I plan to talk about the types of data extraction that we have, also the granularity levels that defines the, the level of annotation that we will have in each of these extractions, uh, the quality control processes that we have in place, and also how this whole endeavor is actually a data-oriented process, how we use data and what type of data we collect and what type of insights we, can, uh, we already take uh, out of it. So just a very quick recap, uh, what PLASI does is essentially data liberation. So we, we have everything uh, enclosed in this flat format as a PDF, and then we extract parts of it that cites each other. And this is all accessible uh, for everybody, including when the paper is closed access. Uh, this data goes to Treatment Bank, which is our uh, data repository from Treatment Bank, essentially goes to different partners, as Donut mentioned, in the previous lecture, uh, more, I guess, uh, known the GB uh, and Zenodo. So uh, data comes first to treatment bank and then is forward to these two uh, different uh, or even more partners. Of course, we have some, some rules that we call a gatekeeper that can hold this data traffic if certain conditions are not respected. And that's one of the reasons why you can find more stuff on treatment bank and not on GB. That's because this uh, there are some papers being uh, held back due to data problems that we are yet to fix. Uh, but uh, how actually challenging is this data liberation process? 
uh, you can imagine that uh, the diversity of layouts that we have in journals, and I'm talking here specifically about uh, very modern and current journals, is out of charts, right? So on your right, you have a treatment that it starts with the uh, genus name in, um, in the normal paragraph, and on your right, you have a different heading setting for the, the, the taxonomic name, which is used to identify treatments. And also you can see that there are other differences between uh, these two different papers from two different journals uh, related to the other uh, parts of uh, a treatment. So this is uh, how challenging it is to have one single automatic process to process every single paper that is out there. And when we talk about old publications, then the challenge is even harder because we have the challenge of the OCR, the quality of the characters. Uh, here you have an example on the on the same text extract being copied and pasted to a text editor to see how the quality of the OCR matters when you're dealing with old publications. And of course, as a taxonomist myself, I'm deeply interested in the information that is presented in old publications. So this is a particular important challenge that we are trying to cope with different strategies as well. Uh, but we have, as I, as I explained at the beginning, different types of data extraction. One, and perhaps the most obvious one, is when we extract information from one specific paper alone. And that is what we call individual process. So we can simply ingest any paper on GGI and start doing the steps on your right, uh, specifically or especially the, the ones highlighted in red, to have at the end the paper extracted and all the information is annotated and eventually available on GB and Zenodo as well. But we also have a template-based process, and this is more um, at least interesting from the point of, view, point of view of automation, because if we have a template, we are essentially teaching GGI, Gold Again Imagine, the software that we use for these extractions and that we will cover more deeply in other, in other lectures, uh, how to find information we need and how to annotate them. So on your right, you can see that we are passing information regarding a type of heading and, the, and it, it is highlighted specifically the taxonomic name that will become the heading of a treatment. So when we teach this to GGI, we have a template, which is a, basically a text file with all these informations uh, concentrated in a single file. and the availability of templates can deeply increase the quality of the data out of this, uh, of the processing of specific papers from a specific journal and uh, uh, a time window because journals ch also change layouts. So this is a specific to journal and the graphic layout that works for a given time. In order to produce a template though, we have different phases and these phases are really important to understand first uh, how many different templates we will need to cover a specific journal, and that's the discovery phase. But we also have the template construction phase, which is a very time-consuming part of the process because we have to build and test in an interactive process uh, this template. So we build, run, batch pro processes and start uh, checking the, the parameters that we do, check for quality control of the template, before we can move to production, which is the processing phase and, it, and the phase where the data liberation actually happens. So we also have granularity levels, and I think this is particularly important because uh, we can have something more automatic, and this ultimate level will have uh, the solution out of box from GGI based on, the, on, on GGI uh, and also on the template. But also, but also, I think the message that I need to pass is that the template and GGI is as good as the journal and the layout can be consistent. So if the journal varies a lot, if the layout varies a lot, it's really hard to predict all this variation. So the template will probably have um, not an outstanding uh, performance. But ultimate level, we concentrate on fixing problems on the quality control step, which will have a lecture on its own. Um, low level, we already have treatment citations and, and information available uh, for holotypes correctly marked, and high level, we have basically everything. And to illustrate the difference, here you have the ultimate level, one ultimate level example, we can see uh, some informations are being annotated and highlighted in different colors, 
but not every single piece of information available from this material citation is marked. For, for instance, you have a location in Alto Paraíso, for instance, that is not correct, correctly marked. And uh, in this different uh, example, we have a high level example and you can see that there are way more information being, being annotated. So that's the difference between grad letter levels and this matters because affects the uh, availability of information for a particular journal or a particular treatment or even a particular material citation in a, in a given treatment in a given paper uh, on GB treatment bank and others. The quality control process, we have actually three. Uh, one is what we call quality control is the basic one and essentially are a bunch of XML based or Java based rules that check against the, the, the document, uh, the process document and highlight where we have to act. So for instance, uh, a, a taxonomic name that is broken for some reason, we have to go there and fix that because th that will also um, halt some data uh, process. Then we have the, what we call pre-quality control, which is essentially known issues uh, of a particular batch of papers that we know that might happen and we go inside and fix it because if we don't, maybe we will have a harmful uh, consequence. One example is what we call phantom treatments. Essentially when for some reason there is a, a, a heading aspect of that batch of papers that might produce treatments that are not actually treatments. And down the road, we, we might even issue DOIs on Zenodo for treatment. So that's why we, when we recognize that that happens uh, with certain frequency in that batch of papers, we do a pre-quality control step to avoid this problem. And the extended KC, which is uh, something yet to be implemented, but it, it is designed based on intelligence. And essentially we are gonna use the data collected and uh, the data available in treatment bank to identify papers where we might have missed figures or tables or treatments. And if we put out together, we have a kind of a view like this. So, in the big boxes are the phases, the big phases, discovery, template, development, and processing. And then the, the white small boxes are actually the steps. So you have the, the development batches where we test the template development, the test batches where we quantify the, the quality of the template. Then we have a pre-production, which we are, are trying to diversify the, the sample of papers exposed to that template and see if the same parameters are still observed. And then we have a local production or production, which essentially produ producing in our local machines or uh, moving uh, the production and the template to the server. And uh, these, uh, we have frequency KC and extended KC also highlighted uh, to indicate in which of these steps they actually happens. And uh, why I'm saying that this is a data oriented process, that's because we are collecting data throughout the whole process. So we have the error stats, not only the, it's a quality quantitative, quantitative part of the process because we have the types of errors, but also the, uh, the currency numbers on different papers. Uh, we also have this, this data from the template quality tests, which we are not observing things that were marked, but incorrectly marked. But instead we look into stuff that the template missed marking up. And uh, also the time consumed, because that's important to understand uh, the operation as a whole, also performance of people and the cost of the operation. Um, one thing that I did not mention is that we use for template quality tests, we are using basic spreadsheets and we, we use an, a graphic interface on Notion to expose this data and, and allow people to consult a particular process. We also, uh, I can say at this point that we extracted guidelines for journal layouts based on these error stats. So if the error is too common, we can essentially go and indicate to journal, look, if you if you add this, uh, a, a tiny little uh, separator between your material citations, the output would be way better or recommendations at this uh, of this sort. We also have new or updated KC rules that will uh, enhance the quality of the quality control process and the internal process improvements because that solution with the, the three phases and all these steps did not came out of the box. We essentially uh, had to put a lot of, uh, of developing on that and that's the result of two years of operation essentially. Uh, what's next is essentially connecting all the different apps that we use for different purposes and provide some, some interesting uh, near real-time insights 
So on top here, you can see the very internal stuff. So I'm talking about time tracker, task management, and uh, having a, like a graphic uh, interface to see all the dots being connected. And below, we can see the part of the data. So we essentially, we have spreadsheets. We are used to, to work with spreadsheets. We need something that will deliver at the end uh, a business insights uh, solution so we can, we can navigate through this data in a more uh, efficient and user-friendly way. And that's what we are aiming at. So uh, operation cost in near real time, graphic insights from projects, partnerships, and tasks, and see how they link to get, uh, with each other. Uh, store and manage access to data, which is also uh, something that we are uh, aiming at. <clears throat> Assess collaborators' performance through the time tracking connected to the, all the other apps and enable the extended key C because we, we truly believe that this will be especially important to capture uh, data that is not being marked for one reason or the other, say a long monograph that have hundreds of treatments that are yet to be marked. And um, as a uh, acknowledgement, I would say the, the bicycle project, which is a, it's a really important project that, that Plazi is part of, um, and the Arcada Foundation, because it funded us for uh, three years and we end this project in, in August. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Marcus, for the <clears throat> uh, for the, going through this uh, explaining this workflow. So now the, the, the how things look by behind the scenes. There's one question in the chat. I see that the uh, one uh, Donald already has answered. There's another one. It's uh, it's called uh, <clears throat> from uh, Matt Yoder. Uh, has papers become more atomized at their origin? For example, include the DarwinCon archive and the human human readable material examine section. How do you reconcile what is given and what people wrote for humans? Uh, and are and or are supplementary materials handled as part of this? Uh, well, <clears throat> to answer the last, so so far supplementary material is not yet handled, but you work on that, and also that depends a lot because there are many tables, and so the now we. We have a very good algorithm to extract uh, extract tables and make them accessible in different formats. And so this is the next step to integrate uh, uh, cited or supplements. Well, sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. What, what happens when the... the, the... Uh, papers come together with, for example, Darwin Core archives, like existing, basically. Uh, uh, okay, so right now, the, the, that's helpful if they come along, but we don't do anything. But the goal is to to be able to to submit like uh, tables also to achieve. If right now we, we su submit only treatments as, as uh, treatment article data sets. But that's definitely an important point because increasingly tables and, and uh, in include a lot of data as I've shown in, in uh, the previous lecture. But that's working in, in, uh, in doing. And the other one, the, the only journal that actually includes the uh, Darwin Core archives, that's the biodiversity data journal, which submits that directly. So it's part of the, the, the publishing process. And finally, from a, from a publisher point of view, it probably would make sense to actually look into publishing data sets and cite data sets in a publication, rather go through this cumbersome process to extract them again, because extracting structured, uh, unstructured data, which has been structured data, making structured data again is sort of not very logical. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> coming next uh, is Jeremy Miller. Uh, it's going to be about, we'll be talking about the linking and the role of the material citation. Uh, and uh, give it back to Jeremy. Uh, okay, can see you thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks, Donut, uh, uh, for, for uh, organizing all this. Um, so I'm uh, Jeremy Miller. I'm coming at you from the Netherlands, where I'm a researcher at the Naturales Biodiversity Center. And I've also been working with Plazi for a good long time now. And I'm here to talk to you about linking material citations. 
Material citations document the source of observations and data, and they allow us to go back to the original object. And this makes them a key part of what makes the study of biodiversity a science, because examination of the original object can lead to reinterpretation or independent validation of the data. So I particularly want to focus on the untapped value of these records to institutions and the potential of using bidirectional linking to enhance the value of collections. So today I'm going to present three vignettes uh, involving linked material citations. All of these studies tie in with important collections at Naturalis. The first of these involves damselflies of the family Lestidae. In my lab, we have applied semantic enhancement to a large portion of the legacy taxonomic literature of Lestids, including the markup of material citations. These have been shared with GBIF as part of the routine quasi process. We analyzed all records uh, of Lestids on GBIF, categorizing them by source as taxonomic literature material citations, museum collections databases, DNA databases, and human observations networks. The second study concerns leocranid spiders. Here we highlight the kinds of useful information that can be incorporated by museum collections databases via bidirectional linking. And finally, I will tell you about an ambitious project to mobilize all data and taxonomic treatments for one charismatic species, Tyrannosaurus rex. So we know, for example, which specimens have been cited in which publications, as well as where they were found and where they are archived now. We have documented inconsistencies in the specimen codes as they appear in the literature and highlight the importance of machine readable unique identifiers to facilitate bidirectional linking. We intend to use the general appeal of this particular species as a hook for communicating broadly about biodiversity data and as a model for how biodiversity knowledge born in taxonomic literature and supported by museum collections can migrate into educational spaces like museum exhibits and ultimately into popular culture. So starting with Lestid damselflies, these are a mesodiverse uh, family with about 150 species in nine genera. They have a cosmopolitan distribution with concentrations in Southeast Asia and Australia. We have mobilized 224 treatments in 62 publications. These cover 126 species, 61 of these have a total of uh, 269 uh, material citations records. So here we see Golden Gate Imagine, the Plaza developed editor, uh, you've already heard a little bit about, for applying semantic enhancement to taxonomic publications. Note the parsed attributes of this record that ultimately allow this data to be mobilized, including its appearance on GBIF. So we've classified 350,000 records uh, of Lestids uh, into these four categories, museum collections databases, human observations networks, DNA database, and taxonomic literature. So by far the largest number of records comes from uh, human observations networks, but these are especially dominated by common species. Museum collections records uh, are a more modest uh, uh, by magnitude, but include a lot of species not found anywhere else. Taxonomic literature provides a comparatively small number of records, um, uh, but these include uh, some uh, records of particularly high value. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, uh, DNA is a growing component of biodiversity data. In many cases, these data uh, resemble material citations in, uh, in, in that they point to uh, a specimen archived in a natural history collection. However, a corpus of DNA data based on environmental samples is emerging, and these are a bit more analogous to human observations networks in that they don't come from a specimen object archived in a natural history collection that can be returned to for further study. We went through all the records from the taxonomic literature and the DNA databases and looked for corresponding records in museum collections data. We were able to recognize about 15% of the literature records um, in the museum collections data. 29 of these were from my own institution, Naturalis, which is identified by the collection code RMNH. Nearly 40% of the DNA records are recognizable as corresponding to a museum collection record. Four of these uh, records are from the Naturalis collection. So here's one of uh, our uh, treatments uh, in the Golden Gate Imagine editor and its appearance on Treatment Bank. So note the little green view materials annotation on Treatment Bank. 
This provides uh, a link to the record of that specimen in the Naturales online collections database bioportal. So this link is created using a machine readable persistent unique identifier, which has been added to the semantically enhanced literature record. This means that we're always going to know that these two records point to the same object. And through bi-directional linking, we offer the Naturalized database an option to harvest this record um, as something associated with their collection. Ultimately, we envision museum collections using such links to build metrics on the value their collections are contributing to research. To touch uh, on the DNA component for a moment, and this is still a work in progress, uh, here are some elements from a publication featuring DNA sequences of lestids in the context of a phylogenetic analysis. So we can link a specimen to its museum collection record, its DNA sequence records, and its appearance on a phylogenetic tree. So that brings us to our second vignette uh, uh, on leocranid spiders. When planning field work, it's just standard scholarly practice to gather as much information as possible about what is already known about what you're looking for. In a paper we published last year, we detail a body of literature that we semantically enhanced with the attention of planning a collecting expedition. We extracted nearly 3,000 records from about 200 treatments uh, across 55 publications. Because we mobilized these data through semantic enhancement, they are available for others to use and for other purposes. So here are two treatments of a particular leocranid species as they appear in Golden Gate. And here are the parsed material citations records for a specimen that appears in both of these treatments. And they are tied uh, through this persistent identifier uh, to their corresponding record on the Naturalis Collections database. Viewing these uh, uh, treatments on treatment bank, we again can see these little green links indicating that these records are annotated with a machine readable identifier from a museum collection. So again, as with the Lestid example, these records can be made ready for linking with museum collections databases. Here is another Lestid record uh, from the literature that contains some additional information that could be of value to collections. This record asserts that this specimen in the naturalized collection is actually misidentified. Through bi-directional linking mediated by the machine readable tag, collections could indicate that alternative identifications are available for this specimen and that the provenance of these determinations is available on treatment bank. In addition, I want to highlight that, these are, that there are data fields in this literature record that have a null value in BioPortal, in this case, collecting date. Through bidirectional linking, it would be possible to harvest these missing values. Finally, I want to tell you a little bit about the Tyrannosaurus Rex treatment project. We have now mobilized 158 treatments in 105 publications of T-Rex, including synonyms. Uh, uh, that uh, consists of uh, 165 unique specimens archived in 35 natural history collections. So we know where each of these specimens was discovered and where it is archived now. Uh, we also know which publications uh, 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 cite which specimens. So about two thirds of the specimens cited uh, appear in only one publication. Uh, and a handful of, of specimens are cited uh, up to around 30 times. Disambiguating all these specimen citations is not trivial. Here, for example, is the famous Sioux on display at the Field Museum in Chicago and different uh, specimen codes that refer to it across treatments. Of course, machine readable identifiers makes this all much simpler. So here's a literature record of the T-Rex in the Naturalis collection linked to the collection's database. Here again, we have the potential to add uh, uh, missing uh, data to the collection's database, uh, not simply the citation of the specimen itself, but field values such as the missing locality. Of the 35 collections uh, uh, with specimens in this data set, four provide machine readable unique identifiers. Several others have records that we could link to in online catalogs, but provide only a query style link that is not a persistent identifier. And as I understand it, such query links frequently do not hold up over time. 
The recent acquisition of a T-Rex by Naturales has been a major object for the promotion of the Naturales public exhibition. We see it as an opportunity to uh, examine the spectrum of biodiversity data uses. Gathered in the realm of taxonomic research, supported and archived by natural history collections as objects for public exhibition and education and ultimately as icons of popular culture. This series of images I'm showing you now uh, shows the first illustration of a T-Rex in a taxonomic treatment, an early museum exhibit, and an old movie poster, all depicting an upright kangaroo-like posture. Biomechanical research starting in the 70s uh, revised our scientific understanding of T-Rex's posture, and this has been reflected in both contemporary museum exhibits and latter-day popular entertainment. So here's one of our 158 T-Rex treatments in Golden Gate. Uh, and also on Treatment Bank. We have provided treatment citations to link the relationship of treatments to each other with an eye toward building a dynamic uh, taxonomic catalog where things like nomenclatural synonymy could percolate through all associated biodiversity data. Here's part of a map of the treatments in this project with their links and relationships to each other, including synonymies both proposed and rejected. And as part of this project, we've mobilized hundreds of images from the taxonomic literature. Here is just a sample. And we believe this could be a resource uh, for public outreach, education, and inspiration. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So there was a question. Uh, ah, but this is OK. Uh, Donald has already answered. Uh, ah, no. Uh, so what versions of PLATSI and, and uh, GBIF do you use in your analysis? How did you cite these versions? Well, the GBIF data comes with a DOI conveniently, so you can always go back and, and, and reproduce it. Uh, uh, and what version of Pl PLASI is just, uh, uh, we just, uh, you know, uh, just whatever is current. I mean, I mean, we're just contributing to it all the time, Steve. I think the more the important question is what Marcus pointed out, it's the granularity level. And what kind of, uh, to what level did you go through quality control? Because that is, uh, decides, because if you make a study like Jeremy's where it's important to be really precise and the data has to be accurate, you spend time and, and so it's the highest level of, of uh, quality control and granularity. But right now we don't flag this, but we are talking to GBIF and internally how we can make a system to actually flag like material citations, whether they have been parsed just as strings or they have been parsed in, into details or they have been parsed and also uh, went through quality control. So, Coming next is uh, Felipe Simoes, uh, who's going to be talking about the quality control. And, uh, so I think my my screen is sharing right now. Right? Yes, we can see. It. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's full screen, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So. Uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Felipe. I'm a project analyst at Plazi. I've been working with Plazi for just under two years now uh, in this uh, really big task of liberating uh, more and more data, taxonomic data. Uh, my talk will uh, have a bit of an overlap, well, quite, quite a significant overlap with what Mark has already said, but I'll be expanding a little bit more on the uh, quality control side of it. Uh, the presentation breaks uh, will break down between uh, question, the questions will, uh, as to why we have a quality control, which has already been touched a, a bit, and uh, the details of how we do the, the set, set quality control. Uh, well, it sounds like uh, a dumb question, but it's an important one. Uh, data quality control is one part of the, the whole workflow of, uh, of PLASI. But it's a very critical one because, as Donut and Jeremy and Marcus pointed out, uh, it's what enables us to stop uh, bad data from going to, uh, to, to other sources like Zenodo and GBIF and uh, keeping us uh, tabs on uh, what we are actually 
extracting from the publications and then putting them uh, on said uh, deposits. So simple, simple answer to avoid the export of incorrect data. Uh, of course, we it all starts with treatment bank, and then uh, we move to sources like GB and, uh, and destinations like GB and Zenodo. So we are trying to stop bad data from going there, as well as treatment bank. But that's the first stop that we have to make. So how do we uh, control the quality of of the data? As again, uh, the other ones pointed out, you can do one thing which is the a priority quality control let's uh, call it like that uh doing granularity levels uh you you can choose uh to manually uh, uh annotate uh, your data more accurately using high level uh, annotations instead of an, uh, of the automate level uh what that means is that you will spend more time and then of course, more resources, and then that, that's a, there's a cost involved in that. To increase the quality of, you know, of your data before you send it uh, through, but uh, it, it remains, it, it's left to the uh, person of, uh, interested in, in the data to decide whether it wants to spend uh, the resources and the time in doing that beforehand. It, the data will be good in the end, but uh, as I said, there is a cost involved. Uh, but the other, the alternative, and that's the point where I'll, I'll be talking more about, is the the use of uh, a posteriori uh, QC2, which we have in place in uh, the Golden Gate Imagino software. Uh, as you can see here, this is a screenshot of the the actual tool in place. Uh, so you, you can see here we, we have uh, from bibliographic references, material citations, taxonomic names, and, and treatments. Uh, you have you, you, we have in place several rules that uh, will uh, flag potential errors, and I, I stress out the potential because because the tool is not telling us that oh there is a mistake here. It's just telling us please be aware there might be something wrong. So basically what we do is we go through what is flagged uh, and then we, we double check to see if everything is in accordance and we correct if it needs to be corrected. Uh, we have four levels of uh, quality control within this tool uh, from blockers to miners. I, uh, uh, I ask you to focus more on the blockers and criticals because th those are the ones that actually hold treatments and material citations and other data from outgoing sources. So as we can see in this example here, I, I chose to focus on material citations. Uh, it's flagging several uh, different types of errors, such as broken geo-coordinates and the, the likelihood that the number of authors of collectors marked in uh, specific material citations is wrong. As we can see here, this material citations has more than two collectors in its respective attribute. Uh, that's uh, the reason why this particular rule is in place is that it's not that common to have more than two collectors in a, in a given material citation. So we use that as a means to help us uh, flag the most likely errors. Um, and as you can see, this is only one paper and we already have 82 uh, critical errors here, potential errors that we might uh, need to fix. Sometimes they are just fal false positives. We just run through them, but uh, other times and quite often we need to fix that. Uh, in the tool, we can actually see that what is being uh, what transits are being blocked by, uh, the, by, by the two. And in this particular case, it's uh, avoiding, uh, it's being blocked from going to GB. So we don't get uh, wrong data on GB. Uh, how do we do that? How do we have these uh, rules in place? So we have a gatekeeper as Mark has mentioned before. That's what actually keeps uh, uh, the, the treatments and material citations from, from, from going out. And they, make use of XPath rules. Uh, so ju just to put it simply, it uses tag names and attributes and values to set rules 
uh, that will will be looked up in uh, in the processed articles. This particular one that I used as an example is just to flag uh, potential missing treatments. So uh, that's which is another problem that we often face with uh, process publications that our templates that are in use fail to capture a given treatment. And we want to see that out as well. So we can create a rule that will look for taxonomic names that have not been marked uh, as treatments and that will flag us with the, the QC2 and will help us have a, another closer look at that to see if we did actually let anything go through. Uh, and to work in tandem with that, we have uh, an endpoint uh, on a treatment bank, which is uh, the, with the Plasi data transit statistics, which can help us uh, filter out uh, articles and, uh, and other publications to, so that we can actually go through and see what's going on and what are the, the actual statistics that we have a number of errors, number of uh, transits that are being blocked, and we can go through all the papers uh, that we have available on treatment bank with that. Um, here's a list of the transit destinations that can be blocked or uh, the, the transits uh, can be blocked through the gatekeeper. So it can be blocked from going to the nodo if if there is a big uh, bibliographic metadata error or from going to GB if, if there is a material citations error, for instance. This is just to show you the, the big list of uh, outgoing sources that we have, the destinations. Uh, this slide is just, is just to show you uh, what's, uh, what can be done within a day, within a day's work. Uh, from, so these articles were processed yesterday. And as you can see, only two of them have uh, GB data sets IDs. These two ones that are not, uh, I didn't mark here, but uh, they automatically went, as soon as they were processed by us, they automatically went to, to GB, meaning that no errors were flagged in them. But as you can see, these four have, uh, with the red arrows, they, they weren't uh, immediately to, they didn't go immediately to GB. But after a few minutes of working on them, uh, we using the QC2, we were managed we managed to liberate that even further, just checking on a few errors that potential errors that were flagged by the QC2. Uh, and that can and this screen is all uh, uh, exported from the the stats page, which I showed you before. Uh, here's a just to show the sort of problems that, uh, again, the problems we, we face with uh, QC uh, and the huge number of errors that can be uh, can pile up from, from the extractions. And that feeds back on to what Donut uh, showed us with the difference between numbers between treatment bank and GB. And why do we have such a, a, a big difference is mostly resulting from that we but the, the amount of errors can, can pile up quite fast and we need people and resources to correct such errors. But it's better than having bad data out there. Uh, and to, to cap it off, uh, we, the, the whole process feeds back within itself. So after we process the publications, we will generate error protocols. We'll run through the QC. Uh, and then, both through machine learning and human input, we, and in the future with the machine learning, but currently with human input, we'll be able to improve the rule sets for errors and maybe find more potential errors or even get rid of errors that are actually not there. Uh, and, and they are just false positives. And then it feeds back within the processing facility. Uh, to that end, again, using uh, the same slide that Mark has used, uh, we we make use of all these tools to help us uh, coordinate the uh, the quality check pro uh, processes and protocols within Plazi. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I would like to thank Bicycle and Arcadia as well. Sorry if it was a bit too rushed in some parts, but yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you, Felipe. And uh, I think there's one question. <clears throat> uh, said, could you use this error checking system to check if there are legal issues with permits, Nagoya, ETC, uh, with the specimen cited or used in the paper? What would be the impact or risk of negative reactions of authors' journals uh, as there could be legal consequences? I, I'm not sure if I followed the question. So could, could you go through that again? So I can. Uh, the, the question is that whether we can check against Nagoya Protocol um, issues. Yes, in oh, theory, we Nagoya can if, if there is a way to cite this. For example, you could say we can find out whether a taxonomic name is available because there are rules fixed in the code which we can measure. So like in, in, uh, uh, in if there's a new name, it needs to have like a, a treatment, it needs to have a, a diagnosis, it needs to have a, a spec type specimen in the collection. And if it's there, we can check that. But for Nagoya protocol, in a sense, there's no way to do that because there's no reference for Nagoya protocol uh, permissions. Okay, so now we, I would like to suggest a, ch uh, a change because of, of Areto and, and um, let him speak first. And then uh, we have um, uh, Alex speaking about the biodiversity literature repository. Areto, it's up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, super exciting to be here, uh, so I can't wait any longer. Um, I'm going to present uh, Sinospecies. Um, I don't have slides, but I'm just presenting, presenting the application live on my screen. So um, Sinospecies has been mentioned before, and Sinospecies is an application based on Platz's RDF data. RDF is the standard format for knowledge graph and linked data. So it's what Tim Berners-Lee envisaged as the next development of the web. So Platz is in part based on this vision of, uh, of the 90s with the, with the web, uh, but with RDF, uh, Platz also and has been providing for a while uh, linked data. So all the treatments are available in this RDF format. Here uh, we have one treatment in the RDF validator by the W3C, which shows the treatment as a graph. So here uh, we have uh, the IRI representing the treatment. Uh, we have it arrow, that's a property connecting it to other resources. For example, it says it's published in this one. Uh, it's of type treatment. And most importantly, it defines a taxon concept. And here, this taxon concept has more properties. So this is the graph contained in one uh, file representing one treatment. But to really get the knowledge out of these treatments, we need to connect them. And that's what we do in the for sinospecies. Uh, first, we put all treatments together in a GitHub repository in the turtle RDF format, which um, is quite a readable format. And then we read all these files and load them in a triple store. Here we have an Allegro um, triple store, which was sponsored to us by France Inc. And on this triple store, we can run uh, Sparkle queries, the standard query language for the semantic web. Um, but obviously, white writing queries is not for everyone. So we also provide a friendlier user interface. Here, I search for the prominent taxon already mentioned by Jeremy, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And uh, this is a, an application running purely in the browser that makes a Sparkle query uh, to the Sparkle endpoint and then display the results. So what we see here, uh, we see um, that the columns are individual treatments or where there is a number, there are multiple treatments um, and then 
so, uh, the, the rows uh, are different names mentioned in those treatment. So the, the blue ballet means that this treatment here is augmenting the Tyrannosaurus rex Osborne taxon concept. Um, and this um, red um, ballet with a cross uh, means that this treatment deprecates um, this name. This might be a bit a simplified view, but it was the, the path the RDF currently provides. And uh, here it is visual, visualized and uh, further down, um, we also see the cited pictures, which are retrieved from, from Zenodo. Uh, we could load more images. And uh, because this is linked data, uh, we also use Wikidata to get uh, more information. In this case, we point to all the different Wikipedia pages um, about the Rhinosaurus Rex. And uh, interestingly, we have the GBIF ID, which is not contained in the PASI data because it only gets added after the data is transferred to, uh, to GBIF. So we indirectly get it back from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, Sinospecies also has an advanced mode uh, where you can uh, enter Sparkle queries. We have some examples, uh, query to get synonyms. So that's basically very much like the query, uh, the view before did in the background. Um, here's a query to find homonyms, um, which then in, also helps with quality check of the data, uh, because doing query like that, uh, you might find uh, that things aren't really adding up as they should. Um, so uh, what's notable about the, the PLATSI RDF data, uh, PLATSI is about um, taxonomic literature. So the primary entity are not the taxa, but the primary entity are the treatments. We add the treatment as they came in. And what's an important difference between having treatment and having directly uh, the taxonomic information um, is that treatment are facts that do not change. I mean, the states, things that may, might change, that evolve, um, they can state stuff that is wrong or that is considered wrong a couple of years later, but the brute fact that somebody at a certain point in time uh, stated something if this is recorded correctly, then this is, will not change. So we have changes when we have scanning error, etc. But otherwise, uh, the data recorded correctly will monotonically grow. And we don't have this problem of revision, uh, but we are just adding new triples, adding new facts, and then by using smart queries and smart application, we can get a view of the current scientific consensus. So um, I'm not running out of time. So leaving you some time to ask question and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Are there any questions? There's no, there are no questions in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, if there's no any questions, then we'll let Alex talk about the BLR, the Biodiversity Literature Repository and Sino other Repository. Thank you. Yes, uh, I can share my screen. And do you see my slides? Yeah. Yes, okay. okay. So, <clears throat> hello everyone. I'm very also, I'm also very happy to be here presenting in the WTWG. Uh, I will be talking today about uh, this presentation is about Zenodo and uh, basically the role Zenodo uh, has in as a, as a general purpose repository on 
uh, on this very specific uh, domain specific uh, problem of the taxonomic treatments and uh, and how it can adapt basically to to, to serve the needs of this uh, kind of community. So what is another to begin with? Uh, so now there's a cross-domain digital repository for the long tail of research. And uh, by cross-domain, we mean that we don't, uh, we don't serve only a specific domain. So it's not only about physics, for example. It's uh, we care about the computer science, uh, biodiversity, humanities, chemistry, any domain that, that uh, fits. Uh, but it's a repository. We mean that we we, we target digit any digital artifact, so data sets, uh, software, figures, uh, all, all anything that basically is part of the uh, what could be part of the the research process. And then we say for the it's for the long tail of research. And in that sense, uh, maybe you want finals and all the latest uh, uh, paper published uh, about uh, COVID nineteen or electrical cars or uh, any of the hot, uh, hot topics, but. You will find the data sets, the software, the, the, the figures, all the all the uh, the supplementary material, basically that is uh, <clears throat> that is uh, that were used as part of this process, and some more exotic art artifacts as well. And we will talk a bit more about this later. Uh, Zonda was launched in uh, 2013 uh, as part of the EC's, uh, the European Commission's uh, uh, mission to to uh, to help the open science movement and uh, via, via open air and a collaboration of open air and CERN. Uh, uh, we established this uh, repository, and uh, it's, it's, it's basically freely available and open to the whole world. Uh, Zenodo is it's actually a very simple platform on its on its very core. So uh, users can upload the files up to fifty gigabytes uh, for for each of their entry, let's say each of their records. Uh, we accept all file formats. We don't discriminate based on uh, uh, proprietary, non-proprietary, or <coughs> XML or any any, any type of. Uh, um, uh, this format that, that you might that might serve your use case. Uh, then users describe their files, describe their, their records. So we have a very flexible metadata schema. So it's uh, it allows that uh, somebody can very quickly just fill in a title, uh, uh, some offers, some description, and just be able to continue and publish something. Uh, but at the same time, this uh, schema is based on data site, which is a very extensible schema. It has it's a very rich in terms of metadata. You can uh, <clears throat> define relationships to other types of objects, and users can take advantage of this to basically create very rich records that are connected to the to an outside ecosystem. And uh, the final step, of course, after describing is to publish uh, uh, this uh, this record, and this gives back uh, this register as a citable DOI, as another DOI that uh, that anybody can use to cite and persistently. Uh, be able to resolve uh, one of these uh, objects in the future. And we also allow users to export. We have multiple export formats basically that allow users to, 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 to get out of the system the, the, same, uh, the same record in uh, the data site format or uh, Dublin Core or Mark XML or JSON LD or uh, any kind of format they, they wish to, to import into the other systems. We have other features that are uh, focused on. On data sets and software, for example, with the versioning of data sets, we, have, we keep track of multiple versions of uh, software. We track user statistics for all of these versions and individual versions. And we also have integration with GitHub, which allows, for example, the, the code to be cited more uh, easily. Uh, <clears throat> the node also has uh, funding integration in the terms that uh, people can connect, uh, users can connect their, their uh, published artifacts to specific uh, projects, uh, to specific funding. Uh, and this is something that integrates very well upstream to other systems that uh, keep track of, uh, for example, all the uh, a unified view, let's say, of all the research uh, data, the publications, the software, anything that has been basically published as part of a, a project. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, Zenodo is, is a, of course, it's a, it's a big pool of uh, different objects, but the way we, we allow uh, users to organize and, and self-organize basically the uh, this object is via what we call Zenodo communities. And this is a feature that allows uh, users to create their own uh, smaller kind of like repositories inside this uh, huge repository of Zenodo. And uh, they can represent projects. Uh, they, could, they could be subjects, it could be a topic, for example, like uh, software in biodiversity, for example, or, uh, something similar. Or they could be about institutes or national conferences, for example. We have conference, conference proceedings, presentations. And other materials that might be part of, uh, and uh, users are basically able to to self manage this community. So they <clears throat> moderate what kind of content 
uh, what kind of records gets accepted or rejected into this and the create kind of like smaller views um, you know, for others to be able to to to, 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 to access and then in in this context what the, and the and the, uh, with a collaboration with Kratzi, we basically we're talking about the uh, about the diversity literature repository, which again is a, it's like it's another, it's another community that is uh, where all of the outputs of this this workflows that uh, Marcus and uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, Felipe uh, described in the, in the in the previous lectures are are basically deposited in. So we start from papers that get processed by. Uh, on the on the Platzi side, and uh, all of this switch metadata, all these uh, taxonomic treatments, for example, that, that, that are being extracted and split and deposited in the Zonodo and linked together, uh, <clears throat> and thus receive not only just uh, a citable DUI, uh, but also preserved uh, for the uh, for the, uh, in the long term. And how does this? How would this uh, do? These records uh, look like? Uh, for example, if we take a figure. Uh, we can see uh, there is uh, <coughs> we have a, 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 a related identifier, so we have this linking that, that links all of these things to, to the original publications, for example. Uh, <coughs> we can see uh, uh, metadata, very specific and domain specific metadata. For example, this is the this is terms in the Darwin Core uh, vocabulary that to, to talk about uh, uh, this record. So and these are. Uh, these are the same ones that are being extracted as part of the uh, uh, previous process. And then, uh, for example, we also have rich metadata like locations and uh, coordinates and, and uh, <coughs> anything. So we have to capture basically uh, the, the whole uh, extent of what uh, taxonomic treatment might, might have. Then <coughs> this custom metadata, of course, it's, it's linked to existing vocabularies. It's not something that we, we just came up with. We tried to uh, <clears throat> we try to reuse existing uh, uh, standards and existing uh, uh, work that, uh, that, uh, that has been done in domain. And but of course, uh, the idea is that also that uh, it should be possible to uh, <clears throat> to preserve raw files of uh, these formats. So we, we still allow, for example, to to, to have uh, other formats, other metadata formats that can be updated and are not necessarily searchable, but Still can be preserved and can be uh, captured and, uh, and and stored. And of course, this metadata also is is actionable at the end of the day. So somebody can use them to search them and and be more specific. Versus, for example, searching for uh, generic keywords that don't have a semantic meaning, but uh, but for example, that, uh, represent a very specific uh, type of information that uh, somebody wants to retrieve. Then <clears throat> we're talking about this. Uh, this, eco this ecosystem, so this uh, this pipeline that ends up uh, 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 basically ingests this uh, all these applications and uh, divides them into and into all of these different objects and submits them to the nodal. So this is something that is is part of the pool mechanism. So that basically uh, fetches all of this information, all of these papers, and ingests them, and eventually they end up in the nodal. So what we want to do also is to allow users to initiate this kind of uh, this kind of process. So what we what we've been working on lately is that uh, a user can, for example, submit, uh, upload their their their, their uh, paper on another, uh, <coughs> and uh, for example, they upload it in in uh, the uh, biodiversity literature community. And uh, what happens at this point is that the node notifies Platzi, and then they can go and fetch a user submitted uh, article, try to process it do, 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 uh, through this uh, process that. Uh, uh, the problem that, that has been uh, described, and then again extract the information that, uh, that gets uh, uh, deposited in some other way. So this is something that is user initiated. It's not. It's an automated way. It's more of a service to available to everyone else. Uh, it's not, uh, and it's, it's a way basically to, to also to some extent crowdsource or or introduce people to this uh, pipeline and to, to provide this as a service to, to to the rest of the world. And all of these things, all of this. Features and uh, basically everything that Zenodo has. Uh, we develop everything having in mind that uh, this should be for. Uh, we start with the REST API first mindset. So we try features to be first programmatically accessible by users, uh, exactly for the reason that they could build then ecosystems and workflows and 
uh, be able to 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 automate and and uh, and, uh, and build pipelines on top of Sonoma. So <clears throat> everything is accessible. Everything is possible and accessible through uh, REST APIs. We we have OIP and APIs for harvesting, for example, and, uh, and being able to 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 retrieve this information and, and import it and sync it into other systems. Again, as I, as I mentioned, we want to export to multiple formats, and all of this is well documented in uh, uh, in our pages. Then, <clears throat> if we look at the northern numbers, uh, currently we store uh, a bit more than uh, two million records. Uh, many of them are text and uh, yeah, presentations or or reports or uh, cover types of uh, text, or for example, taxonomic treatments. In this case, uh, we have many images and figures, uh, and of course, software and data sets. All of this amounts to around uh, 100 terabyte, uh, 800 terabytes of data. Uh, stored here at the CERN data center. Uh, and again, this is a very small, it's basically a drop in the ocean compared to what CERN normally uh, 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 processes as part of the experiment. So the, the petabytes and of data being processed and filtered and, and stored is, is, is basically, and the infrastructure that, that uh, powers this is what allows us to, to host this repository as a service to the world. And uh, going forward in terms of sustainability, was another so uh, <clears throat> of course CERN covers a big part of our uh, infrastructure and big part of our uh, let's say operational kind of costs but then uh, a, lot of, a lot of our funding also comes from the EC and the and the open air projects that uh, over the years uh, of course we also been, been using uh, been, uh, uh, using private funding for example to do individual features or collaborations with others and uh, of course we also submit, we, <coughs> we receive donations from uh, by the CERN Society Foundation. Then in terms of principles and then like, uh, like certification, so CERN itself has a program of, uh, a scientific program for, uh, that spans over 20 years now. Uh, so this is kind of like a, our uh, uh, safety in terms of, okay, another will be around as long as CERN is around. And uh, this is, it's, it's a well-established institution that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, continues to, 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 to uh, to work and serve the, the community. Uh, <coughs> the, the way we store the data, the, stable, the way we store the information is uh, what we call the OIS compliance. So we archive everything in a way that even if the model doesn't exist, let's say in uh, 30, 50 years, the information that we store is still accessible and it's still retrievable and, uh, and usable by others. And uh, in terms of certification, we, I'll talk a bit more about the fair principles, how we serve them. Uh, we have a plan S self assessment, and this is something that, uh, uh, and uh, currently we're working towards also uh, achieving uh, uh, getting the core trust uh, certification. But there are some, some, some small things that we have to do, uh, sort of. There. Then, in terms of the fair principles, uh, <clears throat> basically, we, we, we try to, to uh, the way we design and the way we, we build the platform is, is in a way that. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, is, that is in line with this principle. So we, we indeed assign the UIs or require the UIs for all of these objects. They have to be findable, they have to be citable. Uh, we follow the data set, the uh, metadata uh, schema. Uh, so this, this, is, this uh, metadata is, is uh, widely available and, and easily uh, reachable. Uh, anything published on the node is immediately searchable, immediately indexed in, in many other systems uh, and uh, findable. Uh, we uh, metadata is, under, is available under the public, all metadata that we have is available under the public domain and uh, is reachable by uh, OIP image or REST API, so it's, it's, it's easily harvestable. And uh, of course, we, uh, we actually, as I mentioned, we, we export everything in multiple formats uh, and we reference for external vocabularies that, uh, that are well known and well established. So, for example, the licenses, funding, and the custom metadata, it's all, it's all things that uh, are, uh, <coughs> we, didn't, we didn't just come up. They already exist outside in the system and uh, they play well with each other. And uh, basically, our, our artifacts are reusable. They, they, we, we have a minimal cross domain with it. Like our, our metadata is, is works, let's say, cross domains. It's, it uh, covers kind of like the minimal feeds that uh, one would expect. And uh, what we still, as I mentioned, allow uh, custom metadata and, and references to other, to other recoveries. And uh, in terms of licenses, which is one of the important, I think one of the important aspects of, uh, of being able to 
to, to define your use and to, 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 to be able to use uh, all of these objects. So we, we, we allow, a very, we have a very wide selection of licenses that uh, can be specified. And uh, that's all. Well, thank you, Alex. I think we can have one quick question. That's the question which often shows up is, how do you deal with articles that are behind paywalls? Do you deal with the copyright issues? Yes, as far there, in the, the, the biodiversity literature repository and, and say no though the deal is that anything before 2000 is open access anything afterwards is according to whether it's closed access or not that means we upload we can make deposits of closed access but they're all closed access but we, we expand metadata so if you go to closed access publications then you have very rich metadata but you don't have access to the article Um, with that, I'll give over to our uh, last speaker, Karolina Sokolovic, to talk about community involvement. Okay, thank you, Donat. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, very good. Okay. So I'm Karolina. Uh, I'm working with Plazi. Uh, for about two years now. So um, I'm trying to quick talk to you about um, facing all that has been said till now, um, how we want to, to, how we can get help from the outside community uh, to increase our uh, data availability. So uh, just for a quick start, um, uh, so the current number that we have of treatments uploaded of uh, almost or over now, this number was from today, from, from, from yesterday, sorry, uh, for over uh, 49,000 articles and uh, over uh, 200,000 treatments. So we don't do this work alone. We have a lot of uh, partners uh, and we also need the outside community to help as uh, the previous lectures uh, stated. So how uh, to get involved? Uh, so first, uh, our first question is who should get involved in our in collaborating with us? So we can uh, use help of individual scientists from research groups from different communities interested in our work. Uh, that is uh, important. So we increase the knowledge about the scientific taxons. So we know what are the gaps uh, of lacking uh, data, sorry. Uh, also to increase the rate of curated data. Um, as uh, the previous talkers said, um, we have some uh, trade-off between the amount of treatments that we upload that it's automatic and the amount of data we can curate uh, to now the way we work uh, uh, currently, which is uh, human curated, uh, as the Philip said, uh, uh, with our quality control uh, uh, proceeding. So uh, collaborators can uh, support us in that matter uh, to say, uh, tell us which data are wrong. If they see that anything are wrong in our repositories, they can tell us. So how can they do that? Uh, we have the Platzi community on GitHub, which the link is below uh, in your left uh, screen. Uh, so there you can post uh, GGI related questions, ideas, suggestions, requirements to fix the data. As I said before, if you uh, have some taxa of interest and you look for this taxa and uh, for example, the material citation is wrong, you can send us a message uh, doing this in the GitHub. So you can create an issue, uh, put in your name and your uh, comment, asking us to feed in uh, to fixing that data or um, uh, giving us insight of uh, what taxes you are interested in so we can start processing and working on that at least. So you can create a new issue. 
uh, for that and also to help us to respond to you, you have we have some labels where you can uh, tag uh, the comments with the annotation, which uh, whether it's a bug report, uh, whether it's a fixed request or uh, some help needed. So you can tag it tag these labels in your comments and uh, so it is better for uh, the communication. Sorry, it's not working here. Let me just go here into it. Okay, sorry about that. You can create a discussion as well, uh, you, uh, giving uh, general ideas, some question answer related, uh, uh, some question and, and answers are already there. You can uh, share some news or whatever uh, it's uh, suitable. We also uh, I'm, are currently working in training modules. What are these training models? Uh, we aim at increase the external participation. Uh, so we've been um, trying to uh, train different uh, people uh, uh, with different um, with different audi audience with different aims. So, for instance, we have the material citation model, which um, we can differentiate into topics, which can be enhanced material citation, for instance, and uh, also showing how to look for specific material citations. So, with that, this is an uh, example of some previous trainers we did. We can show uh, researchers uh, how to edit data inside uh, GGI. And for that, of course, you have to have some, uh, some uh, logging uh, previously, previously uh, available by, by us uh, to increase or enhance the data uh, of your expertise. Uh, for instance, uh, here is an example of uh, a training material of the material citation attributes in GGI. So um, uh, researchers uh, can define where are the occurrence of these specimens, uh, the specimen count, the uh, geo coordinate, which is very important to GBIF and other repositories. Uh, so you can add all these uh, attributes inside material citation, tagging uh, these information with GI tools. So we, uh, we can also show you through these learning modules where to search for your data of interest. And if there are a lack of data, of course, that's uh, our intent to increase the amount of data that are uh, in the repositories and increasing the taxa uh, number of the data uh, available. Uh, we also can show you how to search uh, for a better uh, a better um, learning of how to search in our treatment search tools in the Platzi treatment bank repository, which can be very uh, tricky for some uh, people at first time uh, they are looking for it. So these learning modules uh, can increase your uh, your uh, text of, of success when uh, looking through data in these repositories. Uh, this is a, just a screenshot of how you can look for uh, treatment or articles in the treatment bank repositories in Platzi website. Uh, sorry, this is a not that good resolution, but this is just an example of some collaborator, uh, collaboration we are doing with, with researchers from Guan. Um, uh, so they are enhancing the material citation. So uh, as Filippi and Donna and uh, the previous uh, presentation uh, said before, uh, uh, the enhanced of material citation as can be time consuming and of course cost consuming. So uh, using uh, your expertise, uh, expertise sorry, uh, you can uh, quickly uh, add information to the material citation uh, where uh, where you you are located and you know better. For example, uh, we can assume that these uh, are concerning locations. But if you are used to this work, used with the tax uh, with this tax uh, and uh, with the uh, geographic ge geography of the place, um, you can help us increase the 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 data 
in, in increase the quality of data in our repositories. So this is just also an example that we uh, uh, recently did this talk in uh, the South Southern African Society for Systematic Biology, where we did an arch, a workshop uh, training uh, and also uh, trying to train and uh, raise the interest of research from Southern Africa to work with us because there's a really um, a high gap of uh, data available from this uh, locality. So uh, just to try to, to, to end up here, uh, there's this, uh, this trade-off, as I said before, uh, with people and machines. So uh, this chart can uh, as apply, as apply, exemplify, sorry, for you uh, what this means. So we have a different degree of, uh, uh, of uh, success when we are talking about automation and human input. input. So as you increase uh, the, the quality of data and uh, so we can say, uh, uh, talk about our quality control and our enhancement, the material citations, as I said before, you increase the uh, specialist input. And for as we are now, as we are working now, uh, this is not uh, possible yet to input a great uh, quantity of uh, taxonomic treatment with that uh, high quality using only automation. So that is why we are waiting for the collaboration and here, are our uh, ways that you can talk to us and collaborate with data liberation. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, for this splendid talk. Um, are there any questions in this regard of Carolina's lecture? No, I think we, we are late now, so people want to go at the break. Um, the, um, there is a question to Alex on institutional support. Do you want to answer that? Uh, yes, so, uh, not the one, uh, the one from your it's regarding the, I don't know, for institutional support. Yes, so the, regarding the observation, yes, I'm, I've, I've answered. Um, uh, basically, we store things in 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 well kind of like uh, preserved uh, <coughs> archival formats, which are very easy to, to, to transfer. And, and we've, been, we've done this already. Actually, we've transferred some some data sets and, and some uh, papers to other uh, repositories. Uh, actually, more like alias to new DOIs. So the reason we use the, by using DOIs, basically, we we are able to do this kind of uh, uh, more like. A, Easy move, like moving of data uh, from one place to the other. The one question by Matt Yoder is, is what, yes, so this is a uh, policy uh, about using uh, Synodo, whether you have just a lot of metadata or you can have uh, use little metadata or just use it as a so it could it, it it is also used like this right? uh, we, we as a <coughs> as an image repository and we, and we do do some caching on that um, in that sense there's there's rate limiting in place which sometimes does not make it the, the, the most ideal let's say uh, uh, solution but we're basically working into for example serving thumbnails of pictures and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Like uh, optimizing for these use cases. So, as as we as we see, and uh, like for example, the thumbnails was also part of what uh, our work with uh, with Platz. So, and these are cached and served from 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 the cache. It's it's, it's a more uh, kind of sustainable access to this. Okay. There is a question about whether we have a collaboration part of biology database. No, we don't have this collaboration so far, but we are open to do any of these projects. So it'd be interesting to, to build more collection or collaborations or 
be involved in projects to liberate more data. As we mentioned before, the, the bottleneck in, in, in our world right now is to get data citable and reusable. So we have all this linked open data world, but there's very little input into this world from the literature unless we really make this happen. And I think there's one, one way would be to, to add to a paleobiology database or the world spider catalog a, a, an element that would allow to, to process articles during the, the, the cataloging phase. Because when you actually look at cataloging, cataloging is like annotations, but annotations are virtual. You look at them as a human, you say this is like a taxonomic name, and this is a type, you type copy paste this and put this in your database. What we do is essentially make, store these annotations. So essentially you say, okay, I'm make a little bit more effort to actually put a tag around that and save the, the annotation. And then I, I export it into my database. And this way, anybody else can come in and, and uh, build upon that. And I think this is so at the moment seen as, as additional work and painful work. But if you put this a little bit in context, then it's, it's different because if you have to think about the effort you make to find a PDF or get an article out of wherever, or go to BHL and find an article and then extract your data you need, this is really the big, the big, the big uh, time you need. And if you can make sure, if you can assure that nobody else has to do this at, at any time anymore, you do a, not only a big service to the community, but also yourself, because later you don't have, you have a very easy access to the data you need in your daily research. I mean, one thing I'll, what I find very interesting is the, 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 the use of, of, of data liberated from publications in, in GBIF. So there are like almost 500 publications now, they, they make use of data from publications. And I think this is really a, a good sign because people start being really cyber, cyber scientists. Being, they go and collect digital data, they publish in a way, so it, it's being, back in a digital world. Of course, our problem is always you publish PDFs and then you need some foundations or so who can face a lot of money to, to liberate this. So Donut, um, so I mean, I, I feel like there have been some 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 previous programs uh, at, at this meeting uh, uh, that are, uh, you know, for example, the the, the cataloging uh, group, um, uh, you know, on uh, uh, taxonomic backbones and things like that. I, I feel like um, uh, there might be, I mean, as we as we get better and better at uh, at kind of creating these these uh, virtual catalogs. Uh, that are kind of dynamically built on on links, uh, we might be able to to provide some services uh, 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 to to some of those groups. The development, <clears throat> I'm not sure, the, the development in GB, for example, are encouraging because the catalog of life now is planning to build an extended catalog of life because there are there is a very well curated bits of of catalog of life. And then there are like 30, more than 30,000 catalogs, like publications waiting to be integrated in the catalog of life. And so the, the way it goes is to, to build an extended catalog of life, which includes the catalog of life, plus also all the, 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 the catalogs in GBIF, and then build tools that the, the, the catalogers can come in and say, okay, I accept this or I don't. So again, the point there is we, we can offer a lot by, by technical roughiness to, 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 to um, catalogers, but of course it needs at the end also catalog who says, okay, I'll, this, is, this is okay or this is not. I mean, in terms of, of new species, I think there should be no cataloger involved because 
it should be published that it's really clear it's it's a valid name so it goes into these databases for treatment and treatment citations it becomes more tricky but then again the the one important point of this work we do is you start looking into publications i mean when when jeremy looked into like a bunch of, of two texts and looked at how many specimens are used to describe new species. Then you find out that maybe 20 or 30% are only described by one specimen. So you start really to, to understand what, how taxonomy works. And in this case, it's not very encouraging because it doesn't really reflect this idea, this notion of, of, of popula species a population or something. Then you can really ask, how can you judge whether this should go in the catalog or not? Yeah. But at but least the positive thing again strong. is that you you have if in the, in the, in the digital world then you should have an, an image or at least a digital copy of the specimen you you cite in as holotype. Yeah, I mean that 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 study was was really just demonstrating some capability and it was it was pretty small. But but I can imagine that that we could really learn a lot about taxonomy if we could scale that up. Uh, and I guess we are in the process of, of, of scaling that up with the, some of the automated uh, uh, processes that, uh, that you guys, that particularly uh, uh, Marcus was talking about with the um, uh, expand, ever expanding library of templates. Yeah, I mean, we wonder what, what would happen if like you could get a grant to, to take the two or 400 most, most productive taxonomy journals, write templates for them whether then there would be an interest, for example, from these journals to pay for being continuously processed. So they would be pay an annual fee, which would then either just open it up or if they pay a bit more, it would secure that all the specimens, everything's in GBIF. So that's sort of a business model we could imagine. Well, you and I have talked for a long time about about the, the sort of the warp and the and, and the and the and the weft of, of, of this. Uh, 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 kind of data structure. Do you do, do you do you go from the from the journal perspective or from the taxon perspective? So the T Rex project is from the taxon perspective, um, and I've you know hit all kinds of journals, and 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 some of them were more problematic than others. Um, um, but then, but now I have a, a very well curated uh, uh, set, especially with help from uh, Felipe um, on the uh, on the error checking. And quality control um, uh, that I think we're going to do some interesting things with. Uh, and if you do it journal by journal, it takes a long time for you to get complete things at, at any particular taxon level, but it's much more efficient than what I do. Yeah, I mean, this is the interesting point, I think, in this discovering known biodiversity is really developing strategies. How, how can you open this? So one, again, is go talking to journals. One is to say, look, we want to get like 50 or 60 or 70 percent of all new species out. So, what is what it takes? Which journals do we have to, to process? So, you go along that road. But it could also be as it's going to happen in bicycle. They could say, I have this taxon, I want to get, I want to know all about this. So, then it becomes more expensive because you, you deal with like uh, different, public, different uh, publications in different journals different ages scanned or, or, or the things which are only hard copies and have to be scanned and then OCR and so on. But it is, because yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, another initiative you and I have talked about on occasion is, is taking like the top 20 species that, that get listed, that get, that, that get cited in the media, for example, and, and liberating like all data kind of in a T-Rex style uh, uh, for those species to create a, a real resource. And that would be really labor intensive, but it would also be really high impact. Yeah, and you see essentially the importance of, of some of these key groups. Like when, when we started a year and a half ago, at the beginning of COVID, we look into bat taxonomy, we find out that even the, the bat experts of the world, like uh, sitting at the m &H in New York, she didn't have access to their publication anymore. And so it becomes really interesting then not only to, to have access, but also it's, it's really important to have access because you just can't, can't go to your, to your library anymore. 
but it also means if if you not only have access to names but also to to data inside you can start questions about co-roosting and you know, a lot of, of interesting things about uh, biotic interactions which you already is really interested in and but this all depends that somehow somehow we are able to to find these these this, uh, publications and open them up in a, in a way that others can come in and make use of it. And it's, uh, I, I mean, I can't stress enough. I mean, I see this really like a, a chemical reaction uh, because right now our work is really tedious, slow. We cannot complete this catalog of life because we don't have the manpower. We cannot process even what's coming out every day, but. If this is all machine readable, then we can. And so really we have to make an effort to get over this bump, this huge activation energy. And I think as a community, we should think about this because it's, it's relevant for all we do. And it's, it makes much more fun in science if you have really access to digital data these days. All right. So now I want I want to bring up this back back to this notion of of uh, unique identifiers for for specimens. And I know that the that the people who've been at Tadwood meetings for a long time have talked about this for a very long time. Um, and this you know uh, came up a, a lot in in the uh, in the markup that I've done. And it's going to be really important in the bicycle stuff. And and uh, and Lubo's group uh, talked about that uh, a lot earlier this morning. Um, I mean, there's 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 just a handful of institutions uh, that have that have really taken this and 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 run with it, um, and um, and I guess I'm 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 thinking about I don't know I guess I guess proving the point somehow uh, that 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 uh, that from our perspective this is a really good decision. Uh, for those institutions that have adopted, uh, 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 you, you know, machine-readable identifiers, um, and you know, we're in the evolution business, right? So, so we study how rare things become common in populations uh, through just the right kinds of selective pressures. And maybe by analogy, um, uh, we can we can demonstrate the value of being one of those institutions that has unique identifiers on their collection. I mean, one thing which came out of this, the, the hackathon we have, we've been talking earlier this afternoon and also projects through the Swiss uh, universities called IE Biodiv to, to create interfaces to, to, make, to link specimens from collections to literature is that essentially this will not work. The only way it works is that institutions submit their data to GBIF and it's going to be linked through GBIF and from GBIF, they can get back the link to the literature. So there is essentially one, one, link, one in interaction needed, and which will, will, could be very powerful. It could in, involve uh, people, and, 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 but it will be one, essentially one place where you go to link these things up. And then you can get it, your links back because you have a specimen ID, which you, I can imagine would be stable in can kept stable in GBIF, which is linked to the specimen ID in the collection. And that okay, so really, I should be doing this. I should be doing this. Uh, these these uh, unique identifiers through through GBIF, not the individual collections. I mean, when we talk, I, I I could be completely wrong, but talking to a naturalist, they they submit all the data to GBIF on a regular basis. So essentially, the data sets are in GBIF, and and they're not just that, but there are hundreds of millions of other records which are potential candidates for material citations. So if, if you would go from that point, we say, okay, we use the GBIF ID as the, the specimen ID, or it could also be, I don't know, ID for, for digital, digital extended specimen or so, then it would be very helpful because we could annotate material citations to this ID, which would be clear, it's defined like an accession code, you can, write regex to find them and so on. That would be probably one way forward, which seemed to, for me, it seems to be really a possibility now talking to many of these collections over the last, last month and years. I mean, the, the thing that gives me pause about that is, is 
you know, um, when data change at the at the institutional level, the, the collection level, and then they're submitted to GBIF, what happens to the identifiers? The identifiers just stay in GBIF. So the main important thing then is essentially is that this link from the identifier, the spe specimen identifier from the collection given by the, the data provider to GBIF doesn't, doesn't break. That means also GBIF has to kind of provide security in a sense that this, this link will not break either on their side. Of course, you can, you can say it's, it's a risk to have just one institution doing it, but at the same time, it would open up a lot of, of uh, opportunities. All right, so I should really take all of those records that I found um, uh, uh, from the, uh, in, in, in GBIF, uh, that match with museum collections databases, and I should annotate them uh, with GBIF IDs. Yeah, I mean, we could essentially, there could be, or we could create a, an attribute GBIF, GBIF uh, specimen ID, and then it will be clear, then you can actually start making use of this. Yeah. Well, that seems like a pretty good solution, actually. What are any, any, what are others, other, your opinions? I know there are the audience people don't like this one one institution thing, this clump risk. I find it interesting from from historical point of view because it, when we got this e by this e by e by the e no i i biodiversity project that you and another EU fund about 10, 12 years ago. We Pro started to talk a uh, prior biosphere exactly. So we started to talk about these this, uh, persistent identifiers, and we kind of came up and then we said, okay, we should go with HTTP or ICE because they are controlled by institutions, they're not controlled by the OI because at that time the OI has been very expensive. But we at that time we did not think about the publishing side. So from a publishing side, no publisher would publish ever an HTTP or I. But it will publish like a, a DUI or so for a specimen. Of course, they publish long tradition now to publish accession code. So it, they're clear they would publish this, but. Yeah. Uh, Donald, so, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is, is any researcher using Plazi tools like Golden Gate for their personal research? Are you aware of any people are using or it's mostly the Plazi and the collaborator team? Well, if there's a researcher that's using it, they are a Plazi collaborator. <laughs> I mean, no. So by definition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm saying that's like me, not right? formal collaboration, but like if can I like, are there people who are downloading the tool and using it for their personal research, like I'm interested in the region, I, I have a bunch of PDFs other than manually uh, taking out, compiling the data, are there people using that is my question. Carol, can I answer this question? Yes, uh, we, we can, uh, uh, we are uh, working on uh, everybody who has interested to, to have this access. But for that, you first uh, need to reach us and then we can come up with a project or what are your interests. And then we can uh, ask, uh, ask our programmer and uh, of course, uh, 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 set up a project where you, we, we can give you this access. So you, you will have defined um, uh, your type of access will be different if, if you will be uploading things or if you will be uh, only editing things that are, are already on the on the server. Uh, so yes, we are working on that. Uh, uh, so like Jeremy said, everybody can do it, but you should have a previous um, access number for that and it can be limited for a certain amount of time or depending on how we we define things. I don't know if I could answer your question. 
Uh, yes, yes, that explains the process pretty well. We have, okay. we have um, like a group in, in Guam who does an inventory of insects in Guam, for example, works like that. So essentially, yeah. again, you, you would look at what is your questions like Jeremy is interested in a taxon, so it makes it complicated because you have mainly uh, oldish literature and many different things. So it's probably the hardest way to get into this. If we talk to our South African colleagues, they are probably more interested in, 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 in uh, publishing a uh, process in entire journals they have. If you talk to the Swiss, they're interested to get all the literature about Swiss collections process. So they, they get all the, they can actually start linking their specimens to their own publications. And so there, it's a question if, it's, 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 there are different questions you have to answer. So one is your kind of expertise, how much time you want to spend. Do you want to just do like material citations or do you want to process the entire thing? So these all the questions we, we need to know, then we can we can uh, help you. Right, right. Thank you. I think we reached the end of the two hours. There's like a dialogue at the end. I'm sorry for for um, not completely understanding how to manage such a situation, which is uh, sitting in front of a screen and no raised hands and see no people in the <laughs> audience. But um, thanks to Jeremy for all the questions and uh, thanks for all the, the, the speakers. I think it's a very exciting uh, time in front of us. With that, I'll wish everybody good night. Here it's late already in, in Europe and uh, a nice afternoon in the other part of the world. Bye bye. Thanks, Donna. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me, Jeremy? Yes, I can. Uh.